So I'm Edgar Rivera Valentin, but I go by Ed. Uh, saludos, yo soy Edgar Rivera Valentin, pero también me pueden llamar Ed. Um, y conmigo está Betsaida sí. Puturno. So I am Betsaida Punta Hernández. I am a research assistant at the Lunar and Planetary Institute. I, I study asteroids with Edgar Rivera Valentin. Okay, well, what I'll do is I'm going to give my talk about planetary defense, but I'll do it in both English and Spanish, so I'll auto-translate myself. Um, hopefully it doesn't get too annoying, but just in case there are only Spanish speakers, uh, they'll also understand. Uh, so, lo que voy a hacer es que cuando estoy dando la charla mía de la defensa planetaria, yo voy a estar entonces traduciendo este, la charla, so la voy a hablar en español y en inglés. Okay, so everyone should be able to see my talk now, right? Absolutely. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So to start off, uh, like I said, my name is Ed River Valentin, uh, and I'll be talking about planetary defense. Uh, what you see here is the Adesivo Observatory, which is a radio radar observatory in Puerto Rico. And in fact, this is where I'm from. I was born in the city of Adesivo. Uh, and it's the inspiration that the observatory gave me that actually uh, inspired me to pursue a career in science. Uh, so, otra vez, yo soy Gabriel Valentín. Esta charla va a ser sobre la defensa planetaria. Lo que ven aquí es, es, es una imagen del observatorio de Adesivo, que está en Puerto Rico, en, en el pueblo de Adesivo, eh, que es en donde yo soy. De. Yo nací en Adesivo y por estar tan cerquita de este observatorio, pues lo que me motivó para hacer la, las ciencias. So before we begin going through the talk, I just want to see how many of you have seen a shooting star. You can unmute yourself and let me know, hey, yes, we have, or just put it in the chat. No, I haven't. You haven't? You haven't. I have. I think they're amazing, amazing. And again, for the one that's on the telephone number, I'm going to unmute you in case you would like to respond verbally several times. And it looks like you're in the chat, so. Okay, so, pues la pregunta, por si, este, para que lo entiendan también, es, era si han visto una estrella fugaz. So, for those of you who have seen a shooting star, it's this really bright thing, crosses the night sky, right? What a shooting star is, is actually a fragment of an asteroid or comet that it's entering through our atmosphere. As it does, because it's coming in really, really fast, it gets heated up, and that's the bright thing that you're seeing. Um, these are very tiny fragments. So it's really, they will end up touching the ground. These just blow up in the sky and they give you a neat uh, show. So para ustedes que hablan en español, pues una estrella fugaz es un fragmento de un asteroide o un cometa cual está entrando por nuestra atmósfera y por pasar por nuestra atmósfera a tan alta velocidad, pues a lo que se está quemando es súper brilloso y eso es lo que se ve. Ese es el, el show de luz que se están viendo. Um, now, not all pieces of asteroid that are coming into our atmosphere are these tiny things that just uh, end up melting away in our atmosphere. Sometimes the pieces are big enough that they can land, right? So, no todos estos fragmentos son tan pequeños que se pueden quemar en nuestra atmósfera. Algunos pueden hasta llegar a la Tierra. And in fact, so one of these events uh, that ended up getting a little too close uh, happened in 1908 in June. It's called the Tunguska event. And although the piece didn't fully land, it ended up coming in with so much energy that it heated up all the air. And then the air, once that air mass ended up like getting close to the earth, it exploded. And as it did, it ended up flattening out this forest in that area. Uh, and because of this event and other events that have occurred uh, that were, have been similar, like the Chelbinski event, which happened a couple of years ago, um, we end up celebrating or recognizing Asteroid Day, which is exactly on 30th of June. And that day is just to, for us to remember that these events happen, um, but that we can defend ourselves, that we have science with us, that we have astronomy, so we can prepare for this. So, no todo esto fragmento, como dije, este se va a poner en nuestra atmósfera, algunos pueden llegar hasta deslizar a la Tierra, crear un cráter. También lo que pueden hacer es como un bólido, que esto es un objeto que está atravesando nuestra atmósfera y por tener tanta energía, pues este, aunque se evapore, el, eh, 
creció este la temperatura del aire y cuando ese aire eh, llega y te toca la tierra, pues crea como una explosión de aire. Y eh, en este ejemplo que está aquí, que fue el evento de Tunguska en el 1908, eh, esto aplastó estos árboles cercanos ahí. Um, también ha habido otros eventos, como uno que pasó en Chervinsky. Ese también este, creó una de estas explosiones de aire. Um, por tal, porque estos eventos ocurren y porque este, este evento específico ocurrió en 1908, pues se celebra lo que se llama el, el Día de los Asteroides, que es un día para en sí recordarnos que estos eventos ocurren y pues tenemos que prepararnos. Y el evento cuando se ocurre, este, se celebra en el 30 de junio. Now, like I mentioned, so we're, we're moving up from really tiny things that end up uh, causing a light show in the night sky, a little bit bigger that ends up causing uh, an explosion of air, right, an airburst, and then even bigger, uh, these things can end up, you know, causing a lot of damage. And in fact, we think that uh, the impact is what caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. So, entonces, moviendo de, de la, algo pequeñito que se quema en la atmósfera hasta algo un poco más grandecito que crea una explosión de aire, si seguimos creciendo, pues llegamos a un evento que puede ser este, completamente catastrófico. Y en sí se piensa que uno de esos eventos fueron lo que causó en la extinción de los dinosaurios. Now, the one thing that we have that the dinosaurs didn't have is NASA, right? We have science with us. We have missions. We can actually do stuff, uh, unlike the dinosaurs, which just stood there, but at least they protected us mammals, right? Um, so the NASA has an office called the uh, Planetary Defense Coordination Office, the PCO, and the job of that office is to coordinate these different parts of science and engineering to prepare us, right? Because amongst all of these different natural events that can happen that can really cause a lot of damage, like hurricanes, tornadoes, tsunamis, um, Some of them we can predict when it's going to happen, right? And you, you get told on the Weather Channel, hurricanes coming. Um, earthquakes, not so much prediction. None of them we can avoid. An impact we can avoid. We can prepare and avoid one. So the Planetary Defense Coordination Office, what they do is they first talk about trying to find all of the objects, categorize them, make sure we know which ones are dangerous. We characterize them to make sure, okay, how big they are, what's their shape, Um, what's their density, right? What type of energy would they bring in? Uh, we track them, and then with all that information, we can put together a mission to avoid that impact if it is a, an object that is dangerous to us. So, este, no como los dinosaurios, nosotros sí tenemos la NASA, tenemos científicos, so nos podemos preparar para un impacto. Eh, la NASA tiene lo que se llama la Oficina de Coordinación de Defensa Planetaria y el, la función de esa oficina es coordinar las varias partes de la ciencia y la ingeniería para entonces prepararnos para, por si acaso, uno de estos eventos va a ocurrir. Eh, las diferentes partes pues, se encuentran es para tratar de encontrar los asteroides. Um, esto es coordinar diferentes telescopios y pues con telescopios usando diferentes ondas, pues entonces también se pueden caracterizar estos objetos, saber su tamaño, su forma, su este, densidad, y también tenemos que rastrear estos objetos, saber en dónde están y en dónde van a estar para prepararnos si en sí son peligrosos. Y toda esta información se puede entonces unir para poder crear una misión para evitar esto, estos eventos. So let's go through each one of these different branches that the Planetary Defense Coordination Office does and talk about a little bit about the type of science that we're doing in each one of them. So the first one is finding them, right? So when you're finding them, you're using optical telescopes. You're looking out into the night sky, you're trying to see if a little light dot is moving. And if you see something move, you're like, oh, that might be an asteroid. You send that information in and then a system tells you, oh, we already know that object or no, this is a newly discovered object. But as you can imagine, because it's an optical telescope, you have to wait till nighttime to observe. So you're missing out on any objects that are coming in in the direction of the sun. And that's exactly what happened with the Chelyabinsky event in Russia, where that impact happened. It happened during the daytime. That asteroid was coming in from the direction of the sun. We missed out on finding that object because you know, we have to wait till nighttime. So to avoid those type of issues, we're actually preparing a mission called the Near-Earth Object Surveillance Mission. We're going to be launching that hopefully towards the end of the 2020s. Um, and this is an infrared telescope. It's going to be stationed out in space. It's going to be observing 
all over the place to see if we can find these objects, find all the ones that are dangerous, and start characterizing them to, in case they are dangerous, we can actually prepare our, ourselves with knowledge about these objects. So the primera parte de que tenemos que hacer, obviamente, tenemos que encontrar estos objetos. Para encontrarlos, pues, usamos telescopios ópticos. Um, pero como pueden pensar, pues, los telescopios ópticos necesitan que esperar hasta la noche para poder observar. Um, so, se pierde, por ejemplo, si un asteroide está viendo de la, viniendo del parte del sol, o so, si un asteroide va a impactar durante el día, pues, no podemos observar eso, no lo vamos a encontrar. Y eso fue lo que pasó durante el evento de Chelovinsky. Um, so, para evitar todo esto, lo que vamos a hacer es que vamos a mandar una misión al espacio, se llama el Near Earth Object Surveillance Mission, y la función de esa misión va a ser este, para encontrar estos objetos sin tener que esperar que sea de día o de noche, ¿verdad? Um, y empezar a caracterizar estos objetos para el que si encontramos uno que es peligroso, pues podemos recoger esta información para poder crear una misión para protegernos. The other part is characterizing them. So that's the special role that Arecibo plays. Arecibo, unlike other telescopes, it doesn't have to wait for light to hit it. Arecibo, you can imagine it like a flashlight. We turn on our flashlight, we're able to see these objects, we take pictures of these objects, we immediately know how big they are. We can super, super precisely tell you how far away they are and their velocity. So these objects are typically, you know, tens of millions of kilometers away from Earth. We can tell you precisely how far away they are down to a meter. They're typically moving kilometers per second. We can tell you their speed down to centimeters per second. That super precision lets you then be able to predict where this object is going to be from now to tens of years, to fifties of years, to hundreds of years. And that's the type of advanced warning you want in case this is gonna be something that's gonna be dangerous in the future. And besides that, we can characterize it, like I said, telling you the size, shape, and whatnot. And that's the type of information that we need to develop a mission to protect us. So, para caracterizarlos, aquí es en donde viene la parte de, de, de adhesivo. Adhesivo, no como otros telescopios, no tienen que esperar que luz llegue, ¿verdad? Eh, adhesivo lo pueden imaginar como si fuera una linterna. Uno prende esa linterna, puede ver el, el asteroide, puede estudiar su tamaño, su forma, su geología, y también este, con el poder del radar podemos saber súper preciso eh, cuán distantes estos objetos están y su velocidad. So, típicamente estos objetos están a una distancia de varios millones de kilómetros lejos, te lo puedo decir, a una precisión de un metro. Estos objetos típicamente están viajando por ahí a una velocidad de varios kilómetros por segundo y yo te lo puedo dar a una precisión de centímetros por segundo. Esa clase de precisión nos deja entonces poder saber la órbita de este objeto súper, súper bueno. So, podemos, yo te puedo decir, después que encontramos un, que después que los telescopios ópticos encuentren un objeto, si se estudia con un radar, después que se estudia, tú sabes, dame algunos minutitos observando esto y yo te puedo decir en dónde va a estar este objeto de aquí a 10, 50, 100 años. Y eso es lo que necesitamos para poder este, prepararnos por si acaso estos objetos son peligrosos. Now, what happens though if you identified something that's actually dangerous? Well, don't worry, we've thought about that, right? You can go all movie style on this and go out and blow it up, right? Now, we really, though, want to avoid that because if you blow it up, there could still be chunks that are flying toward Earth. Uh, so there will still be some type of danger. But if you only have a few months advance warning, this is where we're at. Now, like I mentioned, without a seawall, we can tell you, because we're so precise, we can give you that data that lets you know that these objects you know, will be a danger, but in 100 years, in 50 years. So we give you that advance warning so we can avoid this part. Uh, so entonces, si encontramos algo que es un peligro, pues ¿qué vamos a hacer? Pues una de las opciones es en sí destruirlo. Podemos mandarle una explosión allá y romperlo un tantito. Pero queremos evitar tener que hacer eso porque entonces vamos a tener esta lluvia de hoca. Um, so entonces, lo, la data que nos da adhesivo nos deja poder prepararnos porque nos da más anticipación. Um, the thing that we actually want to end up doing is changing the orbit of these objects. So once you have all of this awesome data that he will got you about the shape, the size, and when it's going to happen, we can then send a mission out there fully prepared to just nudge the object and change its orbit ever so slightly so then it just avoids impacting us. So lo que sí queremos hacer es cambiar la órbita a estos objetos. Eso, con la data que Alessio nos da sobre la forma, el tamaño y todo, pues entonces podemos preparar una misión para ir allá y mover el objeto un tantito, un poquito, y ese poquito, pues por el tiempo crece y este objeto nos evita. Uh, we're already going to be testing some of these type of technologies to avoid uh, an impact. Uh, 
Here we have the DART mission, the double asteroid redirection test. It's going to be launching in July of 2021, and we're going to run this experiment on in October 2022. The idea of this is we're going to go to a binary system, so that's where you have a big asteroid with a little moon orbiting it. And instead of hitting the big asteroid and changing its orbit, we're going to go and change the orbit of the moon. And then with radar, we'll be able to super precisely see how that orbit changed. And if it changed just exactly how we predicted that BAMF, this technology works, it's been demonstrated and we're ready to protect us. And if it doesn't, it still provides us a bunch of information so we can pre to prepare on our next mission. So vamos a entonces ir y probar una de estas tecnologías para ver si funciona para poder este, prevenir estos impactos. Eh, esa misión se va a llamar Double Asteroid Redirection Test o prueba de redirección de un doble asteroide. Esta misión se va a lanzar en julio de 2021, va a ir a un asteroide que es un binario, o sea, un asteroide grande con una lunita, y va a impactarle a la luna de ese asteroide. Y vamos a ver entonces cómo la órbita de esa luna se cambia. Usando el radar vamos a poder saber eso súper preciso. Y si se cambia exactamente como predecimos que iba a pasar, pues puff, esta tecnología funciona y estamos preparados. Y si no lo cambio exactamente, pues como quiera nos va a dar su, esta información para poder preparar la próxima prueba y la próxima demostración de esta clase de tecnología. And with that, that's a quick introduction to planetary defense. I'm on Twitter, the Alessio Observatory, and the radar systems on Twitter, and LPIs on Twitter. So if you have questions uh, that you might not think now, but think of later, you can always just tweet at us at these accounts. Um, y con eso les voy a decir muchas gracias. Esta fue una introducción a la defensa planetaria. Yo estoy en Twitter y también este el observatorio de Alessio y el radar y el equipo del LPI. So si tienen preguntas, pero se recuerdan después, siempre pueden mandarle un tweet. Gracias. Thanks. Fantastic. That was awesome. Thank you, Ed. Christine? I think that sounded great. Um, uh, there's a question, um, Ed, that someone uh, that uh, was asked about how do you determine the size? How do you measure the sizes of these asteroids? Um, yeah. And I don't so, know if you can, can you repeat the question in Spanish as well, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, la pregunta era cómo es que nosotros podemos determinar el tamaño de estos objetos. So, Basically, if you're using only optical telescopes, so just looking through a telescope, you'll see a really bright dot and you can measure how bright that dot is. And after some hand waving, you can get to a range of sizes. With radar, you can do a lot more than that. With radar, when you send light out there, that light hits the object and it's gonna illuminate it, right? Just like a flashlight, you'll illuminate the object. So you'll actually literally be able to see all the way back and you'll be able to literally just measure the size with the radar. Um, so unlike with optical, where you have to assume a bunch of stuff to figure out the size, with radar, we, it's an easy measurement. It's, it'll be in the picture. Just like with this picture, you can measure how big my head is. Um, so in Spanish, so como nosotros podemos determinar los tamaños de objetos, si, si fuera nada más con un telescopio óptico, pues tú puedes ver lo, como brillante eh, son estos objetos. Después de alguna este, matemática y lo que sea, se, no, podemos saber este, un rango de, del tamaño de este objeto. Pero con el radar, porque recuérdense, el radar es básicamente una linterna, nosotros prendemos esa linterna y podemos ver el objeto como tal. So, en sí es básicamente como si toman un retrato de mi cabeza, van a poder medir con grande de mi cabeza. También lo mismo podemos hacer con estas clases de retrato que le tomamos a estos objetos. Um, so, the next question uh, is, ¿existe la defensa planetaria en Sudamérica? ¿Y cuántos telescopios infrarrojos eh, están destinados a defensa planetaria? So, the other question is, does planetary defense exist in South America? And how many infrared telescopes? Uh, oh, sorry, there was another question immediately blocked my head. And how many infrared radio telescopes are destined to do planetary defense? So, we do have a bunch of telescopes on Earth, both optical and other wavelengths whose job it is to keep finding these objects and keep characterizing them. We have several telescopes uh, all over the world, including Chile and Mexico. Um, and so yes, the planetary defense does occur in South America through all of these different telescopes. Uh, so entonces para la pregunta en español, pues tenemos varios telescopios por el mundo entero en la Tierra que están observando nuestros objetos en método óptico, en, en métodos infrarrojos y también con otras ondas. En sí tenemos telescopios en Chile eh, y en México 
que el trabajo de esos telescopios son para estar observando, encontrando y caracterizando este objeto. So, sí, hay este, la defensa planetaria en Sudamérica. Oh, y, y gracias por, por el buen trabajo. Yay. So Beth, I'll let you take it away and I'll start sharing the picture of the, the game. Hi everyone. Uh, for those who weren't here when I introduced myself, I am Betsana Pontanande. I'm a research assistant at the Lunar and Planetary Institute. Um, para todos los que no están aquí cuando me introduje, mi nombre es Betsana Pontanande. Trabajo como este asistente en investigaciones en el Lunar and Planetary Institute aquí en Houston. Este, lo que vamos a hacer ahora es que vamos a jugar un juego que se llama Space Rocks. We're going to be playing a game called Space Rocks right now. And es, si miramos la pantalla de Christine, eh, vemos un juego de mesa donde ven cuatro diferentes cuerpos terrestres, una zona de meteoroide, una zona de meteoro y la zona de impacto donde caen los meteoritos y estos son encontrados y estudiados por científicos. Um, in Christine's uh, view, you can see a uh, um, board game where we can see four different uh, Earth bodies. Uh, we can see uh, a meteoroid soy, zone, uh, we can see a meteor zone, and we also have an impact zone where the meteorite area is where uh, uh, people find the meteorites and then scientists uh, gather information and study them. So. Lo que vamos a estar haciendo es viendo las probabilidades de que un meteorito sea encontrado en la Tierra. So, eh, primero que nada, tienen que saber que los meteoritos, como había mencionado, salen volando de una superficie, un cuerpo parental, como por ejemplo este Venus en Vesta. So, el juego lo que necesita hacer es que vamos a estar lanzando el dado y de acuerdo al dado nosotros vamos a estar expulsando son de la del cuerpo parental hacia la otra zona y así si contestamos una preguntita que les voy a estar enseñando en la presentación y si la tiene correcta pues brincamos a la próxima zona si la tenemos incorrecta nos quedamos en la zona y así va a ser consecutivamente hasta que lleguemos a al área de impacto y somos estudiados por científicos so the way the 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 game is set up is that we start in a parental body. In this case, it's Bennu. And Bennu is impacted by an asteroid and we get uh, extracted from that zone to the next zone, which is the meteorite zone. But to get there, we need to roll the dice and get the adequate number or, or pair or odd uh, for us to jump there. And for us to stay there, we need to answer uh, question correctly, which I'm going to be presenting you in a PowerPoint soon. Uh, and that's how we're going to be continuing on all the way to the impact of the meteorite zone, which is where we're going to be um, studied by scientists. So we're going to start off. Uh, we're all going to be a single team. So if you know the answer for the questions, then just uh, unmute yourself and answer the question or write it in the chat. Vamos a empezar el juego, este, vamos a empezar desde Venus. Este, si te, vamos a hacer todos un equipo solo. So, si te sabes la contestación, este, solamente tienes que contestarla. Te puedes eh, hacerle un mute o si puedes escribirla en el chat, también puedes hacerlo. All right. este, para poder salir de Venus hacia la área de meteoroid, La zona meteoroide necesitamos un número impar o un par. So to exit from the venue um, uh, parental body to get impacted, we need a even number. So let's see. Oh, we're, <laughs> we're right up with an even number. We got a six. So we're off from Bennu to the meteor zone. Let's see if we can stay there. Ya tenemos un número par, so vamos a ver si podemos quedarnos ahí. Este, al, al ser impactado, vamos a ver este, la primera pregunta. I'm going to be sharing the screen now for the first question. If you know the answer, remember to put it in the chat or voice it out. And if the majority of people guess the correct answer, then we get to stay there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. if, if no, we go back. <laughs> okay. Okay, we have the first question here. Um, 
¿Qué impacta la Tierra con mayor frecuencia? ¿Los asteroides pequeños o grandes? So, do large or small asteroids hit the Earth more frequently? Si saben la contestación, por favor, este, pueden este, hablar en voz alta o escribir en el chat. And Beth, Beth, can you go ahead and put yours in play mode? Because right now it's, uh, yeah, it's showing the comments at the bottom, which sometimes have the answers. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, that's good. So everyone is voting for A, B, or C. Please enter in the chat box or unmute yourselves and say A, B, or C. Which one do you think is the answer? Um, Beth, can you repeat the question here in English and, and the choices? Yes, so do, okay, do large or small asteroids hit the Earth more frequently? So A are large asteroids, B is small asteroids, or all of them impact the same way, frequency. And we have so, small asteroids in the chat. Anyone else have any other answers? Hay otra, pre otra contestación además de pequeños asteroides? Bueno, ya está la contestación ahí puesta, ¿verdad? So, small asteroids uh, is the correct answer. So, we are in meteoroid zone. So, estamos en la zona meteoroide. La contestación correcta son este, asteroides pequeños. Ok, so, para poder salir de la área de meteoroides para la área de meteoro, necesitamos un 5 o un 6. So for us to go from the meteorite zone to meteor zone, we need a five or a six. Let's see if we get that <laughs> in the first try as well. Okay, ahora tenemos que contestar la siguiente pregunta correcta para poder quedarnos en esa zona. So to stay in that zone and actually go to the meteor zone, we need to answer the next question correctly. ¿Contra qué cuerpo celeste chocan más las partículas más pequeñas de asteroides y cometas? So, which is, which is hit the most by the smallest particles from asteroids and comets? A, la Tierra, A, Earth, B, la Luna, B, the Moon, or C, Mars, Marte, Mars, sorry. Spanish. Which is hit by the most by, by small asteroids and comets? Is that what it was? Yeah, which is hit the most by the smallest particles from asteroids and comets? By the littlest pieces. Is it A, the Earth, B, the Moon, or C, Mars? Everyone, please enter A, the Earth, B, the Moon, or C, Mars. So we've got one vote for Moon. We've got one vote for Earth. We've got another vote for the Moon. Um, three votes for the Moon. Anyone else want to vote? And Beth, what's the answer? So the answer is the moon. La contestación es la luna. La luna no tiene atmósfera para protegerlo, so partículas pequeñas caen muy a menudo. So the moon doesn't have an atmosphere to shield the surface from small particles like Earth and Mars. So, yay. Okay, so to access from this zone, to the next zone, which is the, what is the next zone? Okay, so we, we're entering the atmosphere. So we need, uh, we need an odd number to go through that zone. Para to go entrar, sorry. Para entrar to a la atmósfera necesitamos un número impar. Mm -hmm. No, we got an even number. We need an odd number. And there, there it we is. Go. <laughs> Ahora tenemos un impar, ahora entramos a la atmósfera. Now we enter the atmosphere. Let's see if we stay here. Okay, the next question. ¿A cuál de los siguientes cuerpos celestes se golpea con mayor velocidad un asteroide? So, which does an asteroid hit the fastest? A, la Tierra. A, Earth. B, la Luna. B, the Moon. C, Marte. C, Mars. What's your answer? Everyone, we're going to give you 10 seconds to answer. Does an asteroid hit uh, the Earth the fastest? That's A. Does it hit the Moon the fastest? That's B. Does it hit Mars the fastest? That's C. Which one do we, does an asteroid hit the fastest? A, B, or C? 
You've got five seconds left to answer. We've got two votes for B. Teresa votes B, that's, that's three votes. You've got two seconds left to answer. And most of you voted for B, La Luna. Beth, is that the right answer? <laughs> so the right answer is actually Earth. La contestación correcta es la Tierra. Porque mientras más grande es el, el planeta, más alta es la gravedad. So se atrae más y llegan más rápido los asteroides. So the bigger the, 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 the planet, in that case Earth, uh, the, the greater the gravity. So it pulls the, the asteroid um, the, and the mirrors faster towards us. So nos quedamos en la zona de meteoro. Now we have to go back to meteor zone. We need a odd number. Oh, we got an odd number. Let's see if we can answer the next correctly. <laughs> La próxima pregunta para poder entrar a la atmósfera, ¿dónde provocó un impacto, um, uh, ¿dónde provocó un impacto, una extinción masiva? So, where did an impact cause a mass extinction? En la A, la Tierra, A, Earth, B, la Luna, B, the Moon, C, Marte, C, Mars. All right, you've got 10 seconds to answer. Where was there a massive in, uh, extinction? A, the Earth, B, the Moon, C, Mars. We've got two votes for A. You've got five more seconds to answer, everybody. Where was there a massive instinct, uh, impact, uh, a, a massive extinction? We've got four votes for Earth. Okay, and Beth, what's the right answer? Yes, we got the Earth. But it was impacted 66 million years ago, extinguishing dinosaurs. Tenemos un impacto a la Tierra de extinción hace 66 millones de años atrás que eliminó a los dinosaurios. Okay, vamos. So Let's see if we can let the impact uh, our surface in the center of Antarctica. We can that. <laughs> yeah. There are scientists that go every year to Antarctica to try to look for meteorites because you can find them there on the ice. So we need a one. Oh. It's not easy for them to land in Antarctica. Mm -hmm. That's a four. Necesitamos un uno para llegar e impactar Antarctica. Y ahí lo tenemos. We have it there. Okay, now we have to answer the next question correctly. Necesitamos contestar la pregunta correcta para impactar Antártica. ¿Cuánto tiempo llevan los asteroides chocando otra contra los planetas? So, how how long has the asteroid been hitting other planets? A, diez mil años. A, ten thousand years. B, cinco millones de años. B. 5 million years ago. C, 4.5 billion de años. C, 4.5 billion years. You have 10 seconds to answer. Uh, A, um, 10 million years. Uh, B, 5 million years. Or C, 4.5 billion years. We have a variety of answers. <laughs> Let's, well, we, um, A, B, C. <laughs> A, B, and C. So, so far we've got two people voting for C, one person voting for A, one person voting for B. We need some people to come in and help us fix the ties. How long have asteroids been hitting the planets? How long have asteroids been hitting the planets? Anybody else want to vote? You've got five seconds to vote and help us determine what the answer is. Five, four, three, Two, what, what's the answer, Beth? We've got, okay, we've got uh, two votes for C. We've got three votes for C. Teresa can't oh. decide. That's fine. So That's what's the, C? It is C. Woo! Woo! 4.5 billion years. Yay. 4.5 billion de año. So you've gotten the rock successfully from Bennu, impacted, traveled all the way through space, traveled through the Earth's atmosphere, landed on the Earth, and landed in Antarctica where it could be discovered. Congratulations. <laughs> you won. Sorrel, I think we're just about out of time. Do you want to see if there's any? Yes, absolutely. You went uh, mute, but I think that I uh, was hearing what you were saying. Absolutely. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us again. Last and final question that I want to 
asked you all was what topics are you most interested in learning more about? And thank you for um, listening in on our presentation now. But can you either unmute or put in the chat box what are some exploration questions or asteroid questions that you would like to learn more about? You can also put what was your favorite part of tonight's event in the chat box, please, or friendly unmute yourselves. I can start sharing my camera now. Again, thank you so much for joining all of us today. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you all. Could you please put in the chat box what are some topics that you want to know more about? And what was your favorite part of tonight for uh, Dr. Uh, Valentine's presentation? You can also put that in the box as well. There is not anything else. Thank you so very much. Thank you for joining us. The favorite part was the quiz and the game. Thank you. Thank you. It can uh, either Ed or Beth, can you translate that for me? I love the awesome Bible. Yes, me as well. I love you did an excellent job going back and forth. Thank you. All right, if there's nothing else, bye guys and thank you so much. We will have more events in the future. You can um you can follow us at all at those social media links that um Ed spoke about before. You can also find us at uh, the lpi.edu. <laughs> you can Google that or find us. Thank you so much, guys, and have a wonderful night. Thank you for Christine for dropping that in the chat box. Bye everyone.